Hello everyone and welcome to another Spokal webinar. So thank you very much for giving up some of your Saturday for being with us. We really do appreciate you spending the time with us. Um, we have a lot of people that have registered through Zoom. So thank you for taking the time to register. And we also have people live on Facebook with us again today. My name is Andrew Kendrick and I'm a co-founder of Spokal. Spokal is an app, it's a speech therapy app. Um, that has a whole lot of programs that support families whose child um, has a communication disorder or challenge. Um, we, all our programs are based on typical stages of development. The app has been designed for parents to really support you to support your child in developing communication. We have programs around pre-verbal communication as well as spoken communication. So I'd really welcome you to take the opportunity to download our app. Uh, there is a free um, week for that you can explore the app for without having to pay for it. Um, we also have a website is spokel, S-P-O-K-L-E dot com dot A-U. And we will be posting information as well as the recording of this webinar onto our website in the next couple of days. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Cheryl Dixon. Cheryl is a good friend and a colleague. We've known each other for, I would say, over 20 years. Um, so we both met in kindergarten, obviously, looking at our ages. Um, Cheryl is a certified auditory verbal therapist and she will chat to you a little bit about what that means. She's also the past president of the AG Bell Academy. Now the, the academy is, to, is there to ensure that children who are deaf and hard of hearing and their families have access to listening and spoken language services from knowledgeable, skilled and credentialed providers throughout the world. So as I said, um, Cheryl is the past president of that organization and was involved for eight years being past president and president elect and then supporting the new president. <clears throat> Cheryl and her lovely hubby Guy live on over a hundred acres in the magnificent Australian bushland. So I am going to now welcome Cheryl. Thank you for joining us. And maybe if you could firstly chat a little bit about who you are, where you live, the gorgeous countryside, um, then maybe talk a little bit about what it means to be an auditory verbal therapist. Thank you, Andrew. And, and thank you, Spokal, for inviting me today. I'm absolutely thrilled to be uh, with all of you today. So auditory verbal therapy is just one option for uh, children with hearing loss. It's on the continuum of communication modes. I started my life as a um, total communication educator and had a young child come onto my caseload with beautiful speech at age four. And I asked her parents how, how they achieved it and they said auditory verbal therapy. So I went off straight away and learned all about that. And um, I think it's a great first option for people to try. And then uh, uh, all the other communication modes have a place as well. As I said, it's a, a continuum. There's not just one answer. So auditory verbal therapy is about listening and then learning to speak via your listening. So, so to do that, you have to have hearing aids or a cochlear implant or some technology. So that's auditory verbal therapy. Where I am now is a new chapter in my life. My husband and I left our inner city uh, terrace in Sydney and moved to the snowy mountains where we um, are raising uh, orphaned kangaroos. We, we brought our rescue schnauzer dog with us. This is Crystal and she's 12 years old and she loves it here. She thinks she's a hunter, even though she's not really but we just, you know, conjole her along. And we're raising right now two orphaned kangaroos. So I'm holding Robbie Roo. He is a little boy whose mum and twin were killed by a car near, near here. And Guy has Miss Roo Roo. 
And um, they are now on soft release, which means they, they'll leave us soon. They, they're out all day and all night, but they still come home for a bottle of milk every night. And um, they'll, they'll leave when they're ready. They tell us when they're ready. So that's our little life here in the snowy mountains. Awesome. And I have been to Sherilyn, guys, and it's truly amazing. Um, although, for those of you living in parts of Asia, Cheryl let me know yesterday that it was minus two last night. So it gets very, very chilly. Um, so today's topic is on looking at a child's current level of function. So Cheryl, what does this mean and how does it apply to children, firstly with a hearing loss, but then also how does it apply for children who may have another challenge other than hearing loss? So current level of functioning is, is something that I realized uh, therapists and teachers and, and parents also um, didn't really have a handle on for their children. Uh, they were often working at a level lower than where the child was performing. And I, um, decided to work on a form that people could fill out that captured their child's current level of functioning across a, a lot of different areas, which we'll go through during uh, this time today and then the next one as well. Uh, and it has worked very well for everyone that I've introduced it to. They, they're just amazed at how much better they know the child, which then enables them to set better goals. So the form, yes, was developed because my, my um, career was with children with hearing loss. But 40% of all children with hearing loss have an additional condition. And um, even if your child that, that, that you're working with or parents, if your child doesn't have a hearing loss, current level of functioning is applicable to all children. It, it is for every child. It doesn't matter what you're what your challenges are. And as we go through the form, I'll talk you through changing parts of it that are um, specific for children with hearing loss and how to adapt it for your needs exactly. Uh, so here, I think Andrew's going to put the form up just so you have a quick look. Sorry, Cheryl, I might just interrupt. Um, I sure. forgot to mention, sorry, everybody out there, and welcome to those who have just joined us, either through Zoom or Facebook, um, that if you have, if you're on Facebook and you'd like to ask a question, please post that in the comments section. If you're on Zoom, please post any questions in the Q&A option that you have on Zoom. Um, if a question is around clarifying something that Cheryl's talking about, I will raise it immediately. If it's something that we can leave to the end of the webinar, then I will do that. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so we'll just show them the form. And this form is available on the Spokal website, or it will be after this uh, web webinar finishes. And it's also available on my uh, website, so you, you'll be able to access it easily no matter where you, where you look for it. So that's sort of the, the history of the form that I developed. I, I've been mentoring people since 1998. And as I was mentoring a, a group of therapists, I realized that you know, the children were ahead of the therapist. So I had to quickly find a way for the therapist to figure out where their uh, children on the caseload were. And this has been developing, you know, throughout my career and it gets tweaked all the time. I do have my name at the bottom, but anybody that uses it is welcome to adapt it. I just ask that you leave my name at the bottom. And I love it if you put adapted by your name and then send me a copy because I get to see all the wild and wonderful ways you make it work for for yourself for different populations. So uh, would you, we'll talk about uh, the top section, Andrew, if you wanna to point to it or it's in, it's the very top of the go. form and that's just the, um, it, it, it's just about the child's information. So you can see that it's, 
uh, information that er that you'll have on every child, the name and the date of birth, their chronological age, the date that you're filling out this form. And if your child doesn't have hearing loss, you can um, put, put in there when they started their intervention program or the type of intervention program. You change those boxes for whatever makes sense for you and your child. Also where it says listening age um, or hearing age or implant age, you can just put the length of time they've been in their program. And we'll talk about that um, as we get to the bottom of the form during the next webinar, why that's an important piece of information for, for you to have about, about your child. How long have they been in, their, in this current program or this current um, methodology that you've chosen for your child. Now, the, um, the next section is all about access. And yes, it's very important for children with hearing loss. We have to make sure that they have access to the entire speech range. But um, parents and teachers with, with children without hearing loss need to know how well their children are accessing verbal information because nearly all instruction is done verbally. And again, if, you, if you're using some other method to input language to your child, you can adapt this form as needed. But one of the most important areas I think is the distance and how far away your child is able to really uh, comprehend a language. And if it's a visual language, that's an important uh, aspect to note for anyone that's going to work with your child. And if it's um, auditory, are they attentive only if the speaker is very close or can they actually attend from quite a distance? A lot of children without hearing loss benefit from classroom amplification systems. And this is an important area on the document to note that. Um, Andrew, I'm just going to step back from the form for a minute and say that this form is a, it's a one page snapshot of your child. And I, in my perfect world, this form would be in the front of every child's file and every parent would have a current copy with them so that when they go to meetings with professionals, they can show them their child in a snapshot, their child at a glance. And it should never go beyond one page because you know how we all are. We don't read more than one page. And this captures your child perfectly on one page and people can then develop a program around your child's current level of functioning. Uh, Andrew, do you have anything specific that you'd like me to delve into now or just no, keep I, going on the form? No, not at this time. Okay, okay. So then there's a section labeled audition you might you might see on the form. And this is a place to record, you know, critical um, units that your child can hold in their memory. And uh, an example is how many directions can your child follow? Can they go and get their shoes? Or can they go and get their shoes and their coat? Or can they go get their shoes, their coat and their school bag? That's three critical units. Or even more, can they go get their shoes, their coat, their school bag, and go to the door and wait for you until you're ready to take them out? So all children have to develop an auditory memory to hold critical units. And you can write in there what your child can hold in their memory. And there's all different kinds of critical units. There's um, single words, there's directions, as I just said. And in our, in our auditory verbal world, we follow hierarchies of auditory development. They're based on um, typical children developing their auditory memory. And the reason they need to hold critical elements is so that they can learn complex language. So this is important for every, every child that, would, that you, we would be talking about today on this webinar. And Auditory hierarchies are available for free all over the internet. All of the 
uh, cochlear implant manufacturers would have examples of uh, auditory hierarchies that you can download for free. And many, many auditory verbal therapists would have auditory hierarchies on their websites that you could also download. Just Google auditory hierarchy and you'll be amazed what comes up. Naturally, my favorite auditory hierarchies are on the cochlear website because I created them in conjunction with Andrew when he worked for Cochlear and, and they sit lovingly on that website still today, which is great, even though uh, Andrew isn't there guarding them anymore. So what, um, you might just give the name of that um, hierarchy so people can just Google it a little easier. So one is called, it, it's embedded in Sound Foundation for Babies or, and, um, and there's also a tr track a listening child is another one that has an auditory hierarchy in it. And then um, drawing a blank, but you know the one across the top, Andrew? Integrated scales of development. Yeah, that's it, thanks. Integrated scales of development. So those, um, those are great uh, hierarchies and, and many of them have more than just audition in them. They have language and speech as well and general development. So they're great little um, developmental checklists or developmental hierarchies that will look at your entire child. And I'll have a lot more to say about looking at the entire child at the next webinar. Um, as we move down the form, we'll get to the general development area. And just picking up on that, Cheryl, I know that um, Advanced Bionics and Medel also have similar um, forms around hierarchy. So again, if you visit any of the manufacturers, so Cochlear, Medel or Advanced Bionics, you'll be able to find resources there to support um, today's webinar. Yep. And therapists, you know, you, you Google auditory verbal therapy, you'll see a lot of renowned auditory verbal therapists have websites and they'll have auditory hierarchies um, on, their, on their websites that they've developed or that they um, support and, and recommend. And I'm just going to remind people on Zoom um, to use the Q&A option for your questions. Thanks, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the form now, we've talked about the first three sections, the general information and, and the access to sound, which is labeled lean. We talked about audition. And the next section is language. Now this form um, has a pre-verbal rendition and a verbal rendition. We're looking at the verbal rendition. The, the main difference between the verbal and the pre-verbal is in the language section. So as you look through the pre-verbal section, you'll see that it, in language, it's mostly looking at the child's pragmatics. And that's because pragmatics are the foundation for a child learning language. And, um, you know, this current level of functioning form, I, I teach entire courses on how to use it and what what resources you need to help you find the current level of functioning. Because ultimately, once this form is filled out, what you want to do is write long-term long goals for your child based on where they are. And um, I'll talk more about that, uh, writing the goals and how to measure progress um, in the next webinar as well. So, Carol, I wonder if you might just chat a little bit about pragmatics and what that is. Yeah, so pragmatics is a child's uh, intent to use language. So even if you know, we look at young babies, what do young babies do to, to indicate that they want to communicate with us, that they want to engage with us? And, and they might point a finger at, at a toy. And that pointing the finger can mean, oh, look at that toy. They're commenting on the toy or it could be that they want the toy, they're requesting the toy. Or it might be, oh, I'm afraid of that toy, they're rejecting that toy. It's all the meanings that that point could have for that child at that moment in time. And parents are masters of understanding their child's nonverbal pragmatic communication. And we want to 
a look at our children and make sure that all of that was in place or is getting in place. Uh, and we write goals around it for young babies or for children that have um, delays and need to develop all of that. Thank you. Sure. I love your questions, Andrew. And if anybody else has any, just uh, let me know. We have a few coming all through, right. but I think we can, there's a few that we can wait for till the end. Okay. 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 So that the pre-verbal is in language is all about the pragmatics. Then in, on the verbal form, we're going to really start looking at a child's vocabulary. There are very typical growth patterns for children's receptive and expressive vocabulary. And again, when I teach, when I teach courses on this, I, we go in depth into how many more words should a child have receptively than expressively? And, you know, what is that ratio like? And what types of words that should they be? And what should the ratios be within those categories of words? It's a, it's a science, a truly, it's a fantastic science. And hopefully parents, you're with a therapist that can access that information if they don't know it. And that's how you start writing appropriate goals for your child in terms of how much vocabulary should they learn based on where they are right now and where they where we want them to be at the next at the end of the next goal setting session. We also look at their MLU. Now, MLU is mean length of utterance. And that just means when your child speaks, how many words do they put together on average each time they talk? And this is another huge um, area of study in determining a child's uh, MLU based on a spontaneous language sample. And there are all kinds of very specific rules around lang language sampling. And again, parents, you can um, talk to your teacher or your therapist about how you do that and work in conjunction with them to find out what your child's MLU is and there's age equivalencies associated with MLUs, and you can determine, you know, how much you want your, your child to grow in the next goal setting period in the MLU. The current level of functioning is basically a form for functional information. However, if your child has had standardized tests, you can enter the scores and the age equivalencies that they got on those tests on this form. And what we're always looking for in our world is correlation between standardized test information and our functional. Now, the, the thing I will say, if any of you are speech therapists and you're listening to me right now, I can see you cringing and that's okay. You have every right to cringe, but I'll give you my philosophy. We have to be able to compare data. If we can't compare data, then we don't know if things are going well, if things are correlating. The only way to compare functional data with standardized data is through an age equivalency because functional data doesn't have standard equivalents, stay nines. I don't wanna go on and on and bore all the parents. So speech therapists, when a parent asks you for an age equivalency, they really need it because they're comparing it to their child's functional level, which is all age equivalency based. Cheryl, now, I just have a few you, questions. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, some really good questions coming through. Thank you, everyone. Um, so one of the questions is, how do we know what is my child's MLU and where can I access age-appropriate MLU so that I can keep track of my child's language? Yep. So for parents, it's not going to be easy. You're going, I, I really feel you're going to need to be guided by a therapist or a teacher. There, you can Google mean length of utterance age equivalencies, and um, you'll get some scholarly journals with some tables in them from research and that'll tell you. The way you calculate an MLU has a lot of rules. It comes from you writing down everything your child says spontaneously. And then there's some mathematical procedures which scare me to death, but I learned how to do them. And that gives you your child's MLU. So for parents, it, it's, a, it's 
it's a little bit higher level maybe than what you want to try and do on your own, but a, a qualified therapist or teacher should be able to help you through it. And there's a follow-on question from that one. So how do you know how much a delay is? Yeah, so through these age equivalencies, um, we, we would know exactly where your child was, was working right now at this point in time after you filled out the CLF. And when we get to the bottom of the CLF, you'll see in the, in the left corner, it says current level of functioning age. And what we do with this form is we start averaging all of the age equivalencies that we come up with in each section, in audition, in receptive language, in expressive language, in speech production. We average all those and the, that gives us our current level of functioning age. And we can compare that then to their chronological age or um, to their developmental age, which we come up with a developmental age in the very bottom section called general development. And it really depends, um, you know, what your child's challenges are as to which age we used in the beginning, their developmental age or their chronological age. Mm. That's really important to consider and keep in mind, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of us kind of forget that aspect of it. Um, there's a question here. So I guess um, one question is, what's the difference between audition and receptive language? And then the question here is, if we are mixing words and a little sign to give directions, can we count that in as audition? That's super questions. You guys, thank you for your questions. This is wonderful. So my auditory memory is really bad, but I'll try to remember the first question, which was... <laughs> the difference between um, receptive language and audition. Or was, was it receptive language and audition or receptive vocabulary? Receptive vocab language. <laughs> vocab. Okay, so audition to me, it's about your child's access to the auditory signal and then um, being able to hold units in their auditory memory. Now, language is what the units are made of. So vocabulary and receptive language, that is the medium that the child will have to listen to to retain the, the units in audition. So they're very um, intertwined. Audition can be uh, just their, their ability to perceive the auditory signal and hold it, and then language is what that's made up of. Does that make sense, Andrew, or is that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question here around MLUs. This is a great question, Gia. Are MLUs with age equivalency the same across cultures? Yeah, so you would need to check your own language for your um, stats in MLU. Um, I've worked with many therapists in many different languages. And, and even though we base everything on English when we're teaching therapists in a different language, many, many uh, countries do have speech therapists that have, found, that have determined norms in their own language. So it's important to look for those. Andrew, there's a second part of that other question, though. Yeah, so second part is when you say spontaneous response, does this mean the child is not just echoing? Right. So for a language sample, it can't be imitated. It has to be what they say on their own. So a child might imitate, you know, three and four words at a time that you say. But if you sit back and really just give them time to say what they can say on their own, they may only be saying one or two words. And it's really important that... For a language sample, you're capturing only what they say on their very own spontaneously. We might keep going with your presentation, Cheryl. We do have a few more questions, but I'll leave sure. those till a bit later. Okay. So we were talking about then um, the, the language section, and we're, we've talked about vocabulary, and we've talked about the MLU. And then you when you find out age equivalencies, what I do for my caseload is that I plot the child's language abilities on a hierarchy. So just like we had auditory hierarchies, 
in the audition section I talked to you about. There are typical language development hierarchies everywhere on the internet. And I would imagine in various countries, you'll find your own, own as well. Or if you speak English and your home language, you might be able to, to figure it out. Um, it's, it's always great to, to be able to look at an English uh, hierarchy and then adapt it for your own language if you don't find one in your own country. So once, once you find out where your child is in audition, and once in plotted on a hierarchy, and you find out where they are uh, in language and plotted on a hierarchy, then you can start figuring out what comes next. Let's write goals for your child for this certain period of time, whatever that period of time is that, that you've chosen or your teacher or your therapist has chosen. For me, way, way back in 1998, when I said my therapist seemed to be behind the children that they were working with, they were not decreasing the delay. So they were actually adding to that child's delay. So my big thing with this current level of functioning form now is by the end of it, you will have learned how to calculate a functioning age for your child. Now, let's say you or your teacher or your therapist write goals for the next three months. Okay, where do you want to be in three months' time on that hierarchy? And when you choose a point, have a look and see, have I decreased my child's delay? Have I kept him at exactly the same level that he is? Or have I added, or have I added to the delay? Those are the only three options when you sit down and write long-term goals for your child. And if you want to decrease the delay, if it's there, then you have to really think about your child and how much do I think my child could take on in the next period of time to actually start decreasing the delay if there is one. Or conversely, if your child is pretty much age appropriate and you've worked hard to get them there, then you need to make sure that you keep your child age appropriate in the next goal period. And so how many goals do you have to tackle to keep your child at that level? So that kind of brings us to a couple of questions here around the same topic um, from Anne. Should we update the form as the child progresses? And from Gear, how often do we update the form? How do we monitor daily or weekly progress and how can we incorporate that in the form? Fantastic. So you don't incorporate it in the form really. That would happen on your goal sheet. And, and my goal sheet I write goals in audition, in speech, in receptive language, and in expressive language, and sometimes in general development areas as well. And every time I write goals, at the top I put the date that I'm writing the goals. And every time I fill out a CLF, I write the date that I obtained the information for that form. So as as the child starts to achieve goals, I date when they achieved it. And at, when most of the goals are achieved, I can look at that goal sheet and I can say, oh, well, it's been two and a half months and 90% of these goals are achieved. It's now time to fill out a new CLF and, and make sure that everything is going the way I think it's going or if you've had some standardized testing, add it onto the form. Don't update the form a little bit at a time. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to be a snapshot in time. Boom, this is where my child is functioning right now. Now, put it away, work on your long-term goals, and when it's time to write new goals, you may well want to fill out a new CLF. This brings us Did to, that yeah, yeah. The, the, for sure, Cheryl, thank you. And, and I guess this is just going, um, carrying on from what you've just been talking in terms of gold. Louisa asks, when we write goals, should we write goals every three months or six months? Great question. And I think it's very individualized. So some children 
that have many, many challenges, it might take them a while to achieve some goals. And so you need to be working at that child's um, abilities. And even though you want that child to catch up as much as they can, you children have to work in synchrony. And sometimes you're working one area more than another to try and create synchrony in that child. So I can't answer that question with a one answer. It's individual for every child. Mm -hmm. And I would say when your child has achieved, you know, 80 to 90% of the goals, that's when it's time to look at writing new goals. Mm -hmm. This is another thing I've seen happen with so many um, teachers and therapists. They don't update goals frequently enough and the child's just spinning their wheels in the same place and they're ready to move on, but there isn't a roadmap to follow to get them to the next stage. And can you please explain what hierarchy is? And if I'm checking the auditory level of my child, is that the equivalent to the expressive language as well? Right, so, uh, so a, a hierarchy is just uh, the steps that children go through from the beginning of life through until they're adults. That's, that's just what a hierarchy is. And everything we use is based on typical children with no challenges. We're always comparing our kids to um, typical children because we're hoping that we can get them age appropriate or as close as possible so that they can um, uh, be with other children in their school, in their classrooms, uh, children in their neighborhood and, and have a productive life. So that's what a hierarchy means. Just the, the steps you go through A to Z uh, in each area of that child's uh, development. So listening is one area. Speech is an area. Receptive language is an area. Expressive language is an area. And then in general development, there are many areas that we'll talk about next time. And I just have a question here from Karen. My child also has ADHD. How can I incorporate this with the CLF, CFL? Sorry. So ADHD is the challenge that your child has. And, and you can put it up there in the top section if you want. And if there's any special, um, you know, classroom or therapy um, procedures that, that are incorporated for your child, you could write them on the CLF as well. Even though your, your child has that challenge, you're still wanting the child to go from A to B, B to C, C to D. The difference is how he or she accomplishes that, but the goals remain the same. I hope that helps. Yeah, and I think Cheryl just done that as well. I think the um, CFL it really provides us with a great opportunity to work with other service providers. So if your child is working with um, someone specialising in ADHD, then that's a great opportunity for you to collaborate with that professional using the CFL to make sure that you're incorporating all the, all the functional milestones for that child based on their challenges and needs. Right. And as, and as Andrew is dyslexic, um, his challenge is putting the letters in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> so I will CLF. get it right by, I'm going to practice that this week, <laughs> CLF, no, CLF, point... CLF a hundred times. <laughs> your point is well taken. This is, and I'll say it again, if I've said it a hundred times, I've said it a thousand, it's a snapshot in time. It's the best way to communicate where your child is right now with a whole group of people. and. I said at the beginning, my dream for the world is that the CLF would be in the front of every child's folder or file, and that when uh, teams of professionals get together with parents to talk about a child, they could use this CLF to look at the child's strengths, to look at where the child needs to go next, and how to write the goals appropriately. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I, th I think you've kind of answered this already. I'll just I'll just repeat the question. See if there's anything you wanted to add. My child might have different goals. So how do I manage to work on each one of them? Do I work on one goal for a week and then move on? I know that uh, previously you sort of said we may be working on different goals in different areas at the one time. Yeah. Yeah, so typically your child, uh, it really depends what your child's challenge is. Um, if a child has cerebral palsy and their um, listening and their receptive language and their expressive language is all age appropriate, but you're working on fine and gross motor perhaps and maybe speech, then you're going to have goals in those areas that you need to work on. And when I talked about synchrony, we really want to be sure that across all the areas of child development, we're working toward getting your child into synchrony, his body into synchrony, his learning into synchrony. So if one area is quite delayed, we're going to work on that a fair bit more than the other areas as we try to bring it into synchrony, if it's possible. And again, professionals will guide you in whether or not it is possible. Some kids cannot be age appropriate in every area, and that's okay, but you're making sure the other areas are synchronous. So you might be working in one area or you might be working across many areas, and your teacher or your therapist can guide you in, in the goals you should be working on each, each week. And Kathy asks, a child I currently see for therapy verbally expresses two item combination, like Papa carry, grandma up, grandpa down, a mixture of English and Chinese words. Our challenge when parents play with her or when we play in therapy, noun plus noun, she only comprehends only one item. Where is our point of breakdown? Oh, I like the point of breakdown. <laughs> Well, so she is spontaneously combining two words, and yet she isn't uh, holding in her auditory memory two nouns. It could be because it's set up as a test. It could be because you have items on the table and you're saying to her, give me A and B. So, you know, this is a soapbox that I've been on for the last 20 years, and anyone that knows me is just going to roll their eyes right now because... I never get off this soapbox. When we teach children language and when we teach children listening skills, it has to be play-based. And we have to eliminate testing. There is just no place for testing. When a child has something, they use it. When a child can do something, they do it. And I know all the old auditory verbal uh, videos from way back in the day showed kids being tested, but that's because back then no one believed a child with a profound hearing loss could really hear well enough to select two nouns. In this day and age, we don't need to do that anymore. So instead, I'm just going to go off track quickly. I know we're almost finished, Andrew. I would have a bag of nouns. I would take two out and I would say, oh, I got a cat and a dog. Then I would give it to mom and mom would take out two and she'd say, oh, I got a chair and a car. Then I'd hand it to the kid. I'd let the kid take out two and I'd see what they said. If they said dog, cow, they have two nouns. If they say nothing, then I say, oh, you got a dog and a cow and you're giving them the language that, that they need to be able to do noun plus noun. But no matter what, no more testing, just teach the language structure of noun plus noun. Off just the on the, sorry. So just on that, I wonder if you might quickly talk about testing versus assessing. Yeah. So, you know, you can informally assess what a child is picking up uh, just by playing with them and listening and also providing a model and seeing what they imitate. It's all about giving the child enough input so that they've heard the language enough in meaningful play so that then they can act on that. And I'm not big on making the child prove to me that they've comprehended something but I am big 
on having them imitate the structures and then I provide lots of opportunities for them to use them spontaneously. And it's all about input, 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 and then waiting for them to use it spontaneously when I set up a very specific activity where they could use that structure. Do you want to add more to that, Andrew? No, I think you've covered that very nicely. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. and, and I guess just with this assessments, you know, assessments are a more formal procedure where you're actually looking at, again, a point in time, what your child's able to do and, and maybe what you need to be working on in the future. So there is a very big distinction between testing a child for the sake of them just repeating it back um, as opposed to formal assessing and checklists. So um, we, we only do have a few minutes left. So if you have any more questions, please post them. So Cheryl... What challenges can I expect when determining my child's CLF who has auditory <laughs> dyssynchrony? Ah, yes. Yeah. So, you know, um, auditory dyssynchrony is, is such an interesting, interesting animal. And addressing it is different with each child because you just don't know uh, what, what's going to click for that child. So the, the first thing I would say is you might want to start with more visuals for a child with auditory dyssynchrony. And then after you have some success, pull back the visuals and see how it's going. Each child is different and, and I don't have a simple, easy answer for you. I'm sorry. The challenges in filling out the CLF are, you know, really um, trying to figure out where your child is and, and, and getting it down on paper. And if you can get some help from a teacher or a therapist, that would be really great. But you parents know your child the best. Mm. You might just need help in how to record it on the CLF. Mm. And, and I think, you know, just to add to that, it really underscores the importance of setting your goals, but also um, consistently checking those goals to make sure, as Cheryl has said, that your child's not just spinning their wheels, that they are moving forward. If they're not moving forward, mm -hmm. something has to change. Um, That's right. Okay, Could I say one more thing? Yeah. I, just one more thing, Andrew. Um, Andrew made such a good point. It is all about making sure the program is appropriate. So you have a CLF, you now know where to set your goals, where to write goals, how far you wanna go. At the end of that time, if you didn't get where you wanted to go, why not? figure out why not, what's wrong, change the program. Maybe your child needs smaller steps within each goal. Maybe your child needs visuals. Maybe your child needs more tactile. Maybe there's a whole other realm of reasons, but it's, it's your job to figure out why if they didn't achieve it in the time you thought they would. Um, so Louisa asked, and we're just going back, I think, to the testing versus um, standardized assessments. When you say we should not test the child, do you mean that we should only test the child when we are doing standardized tests, but in therapy, we only estimate the child's development through observation, through play-based activities? That's right. And when you're, when you're doing therapy with a child um, or teaching them in the classroom, you're not asking a thousand and one questions or making them perform. My definition of is it a test is, can the child get it wrong? If the child can get it wrong, then it was probably a test. Hmm. So my example stands, you have toys on the table and you tell the child get A and B and you hold out your hand. That's a test. But you have a bag of toys and you take two out and you tell the child what you got and then you give them an opportunity to take two out and you wait and see what they come up with. And if they don't say anything, you provide the language model. Well, there's no way the child's wrong there. They've just had an opportunity and you've supplied the language. So we, we are coming to the end um, of today's webinar. Now, Dinah and Agnes, you do have questions, but I'm actually going to leave those to our next webinar. It's a follow-on webinar of the CLF that Cheryl will be presenting 
uh, on the 30th of May. So I have those questions here. I will post them to Cheryl so that she's able to incorporate. Because I think there are a little bit more broader range questions, Cheryl, that will probably come okay. in part of the summarising that you'll do next week. Um, okay. Cheryl, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I just thank all of you for being interested enough to give up an hour of your Saturday. And I look forward to finishing the CLF with you on May 30th and, and more of your fabulous questions. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I want to remind you that we do have the Spokal app that you can download from the App Store. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, our programs are based on hierarchical um, and typical stages of development that Cheryl's been talking about today. Um, what you're able to do with, um, with our app is you're able to identify what your child's current level of function is based on the skills and the milestones. And then we have the next goals that you can set for your goal setting. So again, recommend you go. There is a free download period um, as part of Spokal. I'll remind you that Spokal dot com dot au is our website i'm just going to share cheryl's website here uh, so as we said well we'll just bring that in um, part two will be may 30th at one o'clock eastern standard time same time as today um, for those of you who would like to visit cheryl's website there it is. Um, so again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, for taking the time as part of your Saturday. We've really enjoyed having your company. Thank you for your questions, really, really stimulating questions. Cheryl, thank you for this really stimulating discussion um, around the CLF and, and the importance of that. Really looking forward to next month's um, continuation of this. I wish everyone stay well and stay safe stay safe in these really uncertain times um again i guess when you look at the spoke app it is an app that you can use at home or the activities are home based so it is kind of um a really great program for the times we live in at the moment i will sign off on behalf of spoke thank you everyone thank you cheryl goodbye thank you bye bye <laughs>